Hi everyone, in this video we're going to talk about a common purification technique in organic chemistry called recrystallization. So if you decide to pursue a career path as a synthetic organic chemist, you're going to realize that most of your time is going to be spent on purification. So understanding when to use the correct purification technique is absolutely crucial. Last week, we learned how to separate compounds based on their boiling points using distillation. This week, we're going to be working with compounds that are solid over a wide range of temperatures, including room temperature, and they only have small amounts of impurities. So the best purification technique for this kind of a situation is recrystallization. Now let's take a look at how we would recrystallize compounds. In the process of recrystallization, we take an impure solid and we dissolve it in a minimal quantity of solvent, often with the help of heat. We then allow our compound to form a nice and neat crystal lattice from which the impurities would be excluded. The general procedure for recrystallization entails first determining the optimal solvent for our solids, then dissolving the solids in the minimal quantity of that solvent, removing any insoluble impurities, and then allowing the compound to slowly form crystals, then collecting and drying the crystals, and if a lot of our material remains in the solution, we can concentrate it and collect a second crop of crystals. So what is an ideal solvent for recrystallization? Well, here's our wish list. First, it does not react with the compound. Second, it boils at a temperature below the compound's boiling point. It dissolves the compound fairly well at hot temperature, but it dissolves the compound poorly at low temperature. It is non-toxic, non-flammable, and inexpensive. And it keeps the impurities dissolved when it gets cold. And of course, this is a very long and demanding list, so these qualities of the solvent are actually listed in decreasing priority. Now let's talk about the general guidelines for choosing a solvent. So the whole point of the solvent is to dissolve the compound. And I'm assuming that you already watched the video about solubility, where you learned that like dissolves like. So polar compounds, meaning those that have alcohol groups, amines, and molecules containing other electronegative atoms capable of hydrogen bonding will be best dissolved by polar solvents, for instance, water or alcohols. But as the hydrocarbon grows in the organic compound, the compound will be less and less likely to be dissolved by polar solvents. So for instance, things like naphthalene or molecules with long alkyl chains will be best dissolved by solvents that have low dielectric constants. And in some cases, we might need to use a solvent pair. Ideally, we want the compound to be soluble in hot solvent and insoluble in cold solvent, but we don't always get that lucky. So if this doesn't work, then we could use a pair of miscible liquids as the solvent. One liquid that is going to be a good solvent for the compound, meaning that the compound dissolves really well in the solvent, and a second solvent that would be a bad solvent for the compound, meaning that the compound does not easily get dissolved by that solvent. Some of the solvent pairs for polar organics include ethanol water, acetone water, diethyl ether, and methanol. And for nonpolar organics, benzene and hexanes, diethyl ether and petroleum ether, methylene chloride and methanol, just to name a few. All right, now let's go through the steps of dissolving the compound. First, we place the solids into an Erlenmeyer flask. And an Erlenmeyer flask is preferred because it has a more narrow neck. So if the flask tips over, most of your liquid is going to stay inside. Then we add the minimum quantity of hot solvent required to dissolve the compound. And we heat the solution while swirling or stirring. And as we're heating, the solution is going to start to get kind of cloudy or murky. And when we reach that point, we have to add a few more drops of the solvent to get the solution back to looking clear. Now we have to crystallize the compound. We cover the flask very lightly with the watch glass. Then we allow the flask to cool very slowly by removing the flame or the source of heat. And we eliminate any agitation of the flask, so we stop the stirring and try not to bump the flask while it's cooling. And once the flask reaches room temperature, and if there are still no crystals anywhere in the flask, then we can use this trick of taking a spatula 
and scraping the side of the flask a little bit. This would release a few microcrystals of silica from the flask and they can serve as seed crystals for our crystallization. So essentially on these tiny surfaces of the tiny scraped off glass particles, our crystal can start to grow its lattice. And if we want more crystals to come out of solution, we can cool our flask in an ice bath to get more of our compound to crystallize. Now it's time to collect the crystals. And to do that, we set up a vacuum flask with a rubber adapter and a Buchner funnel on the top, and we clamp the whole thing to make sure the flask doesn't fall over. Then we place a filter paper into the Buchner funnel, and we connect the flask to the vacuum. Then we slowly pour out the crystals with the mother liquor. And mother liquor is the solution that is holding our crystals. And lastly, we wash the crystals with clean, cold solvent. So for instance, if we used ethanol as our solvent, then we have to cool a little bit of ethanol separately for our washing step. And the reason why it has to be cold is to ensure that we don't dissolve the crystals while we're washing them. This is it for now, and good luck growing your crystals this week.